Welcome back to Colonial Williamsburg. Every year I make this trip and I come back and I look at the photographs I've taken and I've got some beautiful scenery, incredible buildings. There's just so much to see in Williamsburg from colorful characters walking down the streets, conversing with the tourists to just incredible colonial homes. But no matter what I do, when I review my photos, it's all about the furniture and the woodworking. You get an up-close look at period furniture, the details and the carvings that come with it, and it just inspires you. It inspires you for future projects, like this hanging tool cabinet for semester four of the hand tool school. You get a real grasp of the history, but no matter what, it comes back to the woodworking. Everywhere I turn, there are little elements for the woodworker. To the trade shops, like the Wheelwright, where this time I got a chance to take a closer look at their Rubo-style workbench. And to play with the Great Wheel Lathe. Here they're turning the elm hub of a wheel. And here is said wheel. Really a lot of fun. The smell of white oak, freshly riven white oak, was in the air. And check out these clinch nails, Christopher Schwarz. That'll keep you in. That's in the jail. Then you see these little benches on a, in a side garden somewhere, and you think, that'd be fun to build. And the tools and all the trade shops just hanging out in the open. Tour the joinery shop, and you get to see tool heaven, and get to see every man furniture. And that furniture for the common man shows up everywhere you look, from the courthouse to the walls of the joiner shop. If you look around, you'll see things that are familiar from pages of magazines. Ultimately, there's just too much to see to possibly cover it all. In the past, I've focused on a few conversations. This time, I'm just going to be a fly on the wall. You'll hear a lot of conversations going on in the cabinet maker shop. Let's listen in and see what we can learn. We just want to read the dining room table, and uh, I was disappointed when I looked at the and saw how it wasn't finished. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, no, yeah, push yeah, yeah, so yeah, we'll do and we'll do this to a, to a, to a certain extent. In fact, if you, if, if you can, if you have time, if you go back to the little tea table that was in between those two cabins, and if you just go ahead and feel underneath the corner blocks on the front legs, we left a rough. Because well, the reason for doing this from the 1770s point of view is one of my time. I had to remember also some of the other aspects that we have to do. When we get all of this sawn season timber, there's only one way to dimension that into usable stock, and that is with hand saws and with bench plants. No machine technology available to do any of that processing. So that's getting factored into the labor, so where do we make up the difference? We can't make them. There's no reason to make it that pretty. It goes against the wall. As long as the drawers have their proper place and we've done our job. The underside of the drawer bottoms are yeah, it's far along. So don't worry about it. So we save a little here, we save a little there, and that way things are still kind of sharp. We've also got a great advantage in the glues that we use. Uh, gelatin glues made from animal hides, animal skins. Yeah, in fact, I've got some cooking back here. I'll show you. Something like this, though, you start to... These uh, gelatin glues will set up into a full bond within three hours. So it's not like you've got to have these things clammed up for long stretches of time and not be able to touch anything to what really just on too well. So that can partly explain when you see surviving payroll books from some of the English cabinet shops. These workers have a tremendous pace on these projects. Sets of chairs, desks in both cases, billiard tables, some collaborative work, some solo jobs. It really is astonishing at the amount of stuff that they do turn out. So this is a double boiler. The gelatin we buy on the open market, and then we would grind it up, soak it in water, and cook it up in the pot. And it must be kept heated to keep it liquidy. And as you can imagine, it will have to be brushed on hot from the pot onto the work. And as it cools and gels to the temperature of the room, it will begin to bond. Okay, so if I encourage this to cool in a little quicker, you Sorry, now beat it to tack on here. It's water soluble, so you don't have to be worried about my fingers. <laughs> so, but as also, this uh, allows for, uh, for proper cleanup of excess glue, squeezed out glue. Uh, and, but the glue will not interfere with staining or finishing. If you get trace elements on an exposed purpose, yeah. And they use this that fact to advantage you. Okay. Um, more potent here. Yes. Okay. So, but if we clamp, um, the clamps need to get on within two or three minutes. So big jobs take two or three of us, you know, coordinating our efforts, uh, make this work. And, but it's 
potency is going to be fine. Any of these glues, whether it's our traditional glue or your modern synthetic glues, will form a bond that's stronger than the leaf and holds three fibers together. They're all out there. This glue does not tolerate gaps or loose fit on joints. The way the modern glues can sort of take up the slack for you. So things have to be really quite precise. But the non-staining issue and the quick tack really allows us quite a bit of flexibility when it comes to veneer. As we know about veneer, for us in 1770, veneer is not an ugly one. No, we were, we were all coming from. <laughs> 2012. On out by hand, with a hand saw. And then it had to be worked down with the planes in order to get the final thickness, roughly about 16 inches or so. Not real hard and fast enough. So I'm actually still on. Okay. So um, saw, clean it up, cut it up into whatever you're going to like when you need. The, and I'll just use this one a bit smaller here. Okay, hot wet glue goes on the glue side. What happens to this piece of wood? Warps. It warps like crazy. Yeah, well said. Because you've got wet glue, hot glue, swelling all the fibers here, but it's not compensated on this other side, so you will not get it down. Try as you might. So we paint glue on both sides. Saturated. Grab it in glue. Okay, put it in place. The glue is now beginning to cool and grab. So we take a veneer hammer, rub out the trapped air, excess glue from in between the surfaces. You have hot water and rags that are ready. That will get a lot of the excess glue on top, plus the action of the hammer. Keep those surfaces touching neatly for that two or three minute working window. You can come back and tap, make sure everything sounds solid. That's what you don't want to hear. There's obviously two surfaces clapping together. Excuse me one more. Okay. Okay. Um, once everything sounds solid, we're not quite done yet because I don't want this upper surface to dry out too fast. That glue underneath is still wet and could pop the edges and then begin to curl. So we put a wet linen cloth on top of everything and leave it alone for a couple of hours. If I did my job right, the surfaces were made in good fresh glue, everything was solid, it would be okay. No clamping required. No calls, no, no presses. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that we would have to get a table before the veneer actually goes down. Let's say if this was the, well, if this was the substance. Uh, it'll be clean. It will be textured up. We actually texture up the side, the glue side of the veneer with the toothing planes, a little serrated edge plane. Both the glue side of the veneer and the substrate are textured up. Then a thin wash of glue and water is put over the surface of the substrate to size it as a, as a fill. You then take these toothing planes, see I've got a little serrated edge blade. You set this real short so that you can knock those raised fibers off of the substrate just to pass it to a tremendous amount. So you're doing it to the material instead of the bonding to where you use tiling. In a way, that yeah. sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and one thing about the high glue is that it will bond very well to itself. So I've been experimenting with this a little bit more recently so that if I have the size on there, and I've done this maybe about 10 minutes or so before I actually do the formal application of the veneer, and now fresh glue goes on that surface. You've got a lot of extra glue that's sort of in that, in the film that's in the fibers, and that gets a little bit reactivated. So when the stuff goes down, plus those textured surfaces. So that way, all this rubbing, or even tiny, tiny little thin pieces, which we might rub on with the back edge of a cross peen hammer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and as a result, by this technique, we can certainly use veneers to make a piece look like it's made out of solid wood. But in 1770, why do that? And I can make it out of solid wood quicker and less expensively for you. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go through all of you know buying or making the veneers and all that extra prep for it. So. Those are really beautiful cuts of wood, bigger woods. Okay, this is what's called a crotch cut, uh, taken from a big limb junction, fork in the tree. You get the wonderful flame pattern and swirling grain. The problem is the board still wants to behave like a board. Okay, if you look at the back of this one, the pine running horizontal. Okay, good piece of wood because the grain is straight. And, it, and, and the shrinking and swelling with the humidity changes is going to be mainly this way. 
across the width of the grain, not along the length. But that's always true. So when you got this, mm -hmm. you got lots of motion in different directions all together at the same time, and that's why it has cracked. Mm -hmm. Because it's got to relieve the stress somehow. Okay. So you so you don't make a solid table out of this, mm -hmm. because that would be our recommendation. We saw this with the big frame saw here, eighth inch thick sheet veneer. Clean it up with our planes and probably would glue it to plain mahogany like this for the substrate. The plain mahogany will provide good stability, no weird grain, nothing weird going on. Uh, and then this provides a more interesting service. Of course, one of the most important things I wanted to see while I was in Williamsburg this time was a couple treadle lathes. And I took more pictures that I can count of this particular treadle lathe that's been uh, pilfered from the gunsmith shop. The old belt-driven treadle lathe has actually been disassembled, I learned, to be kind of retrofitted to be more historically accurate. Well, things were um, kind of quiet on Sunday morning, and I was shocked and overjoyed when the joiner said, hey, why not you give it a try since you want to build one? And I got to tell you, this is a pretty sweet design that's going to add a lot of things for me to think about when I design my treadle lathe. So uh, let's take a look at my maiden voyage on this treadle. It's really quiet. Yeah. I seem to remember the, um, the other one made a lot more noise. Yes. It sounded more like a machine when it was running. I mean, that was, what, two or three years ago, I guess, last time I heard it. Right, just power through. It's a very different touch. 